Uh, good afternoon and welcome to a special edition of Remaking the Economy. I'm Steve Dubb and I'm senior editor here at uh, Nonprofit Quarterly. I'm here uh, with uh, Shawnee Black, Ed Whitfield, and Rudlin Volksi. Uh, we're excited to be able to talk to you today about Greensboro's uh, Renaissance Community Cooperative, the RCC. And this is a co-production of uh, with FORDC, the Fund for Democratic Communities. And uh, we didn't initially plan to have this, but we felt like this was a really important story to bring to you. And we're glad so many of you are here with us today. Uh, as many of you know, the RCC was a multi-year effort of 1,300 residents to establish and institutionalize a community food co-op in a community food desert, uh, largely black working class neighborhood. Uh, the co-op uh, ultimately fell short uh, but we believe there's a lot that can be learned from this experience. To guide this discussion, we'll be hearing from representatives from the Fund for Democratic Communities, a local private foundation in Greensboro that supported the project, and also a former chair of the RCC board. Specifically, here with us today are uh, Shawnee Black, a community organizer who's worked with FORDC for the past seven years, Ed Whitfield, a social critic, writer, and community activist who's co-managing director of FORDC, and Rudlin uh, Bolsley, uh, former chair of the RCC board, uh, and who also is on the staff of the Democracy at Work Institute. Now, before we move on, I'd like to introduce our director of marketing and development, Amanda Nelson, uh, who will say a few words about Nonprofit Quarterly. And thank you to everyone for joining us today for the last webinar in the Remaking the Economy series for 2019. I know everyone is eager to get to the webinar, but I'd just like to steal a few minutes just to share um, some exciting news that we have. This year, we are fortunate enough to receive a matching grant from the O'Shea Foundation for $7,500 to continue to advance the conversation around economic and social inequalities. Um, in other words, that just means that for every dollar that you donate is going to be matched by the O'Shea Foundation. So please generously give today to help us meet this grant. Um, following the webinar, we'll be sending out a donation ask and we'll be asking for your support. So please, please donate today and help us match this grant. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Amanda. And uh, a few last notes before we get to uh, Shawnee and her presentation. Uh, first, we're very excited to take your questions and we'll be leaving uh, time at the end of the webinar to allow panelists to answer them. Uh, please enter any questions you have into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel and I will share them with the panelists uh, when we get to that part of the discussion. Second, uh, we will share the slides and recording with everyone via email after the webinar, so please don't ask if we're get, you're getting the recording. It will come out shortly afterwards in the next couple of days. Um, also, encourage you to enjoy the join the conversation via social media. Our hashtag is uh, hashtag rebuild the economy. Share your comments and questions. We'd love to hear them. Uh, thanks for being with us today. And again, we will be having a brief survey after the webinar, so please keep a lookout uh, for the, that window after our conversation. And now we'll hear from uh, Shawnee, who will share the story of the RCC with us. Um, Shawnee, the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon to talk about the RCC. Next slide, please. And we're talking about the anatomy of a failed co-op. I want to emphasize that we are using that word failure not in a negative way. We don't think that um, failure is a negative thing. Very often, you have to have some failures and some tries before you succeed. So we want to take the negative stigma away from that. So again, thank you for joining us. I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly, but I'm sure that you all are going to ask some really engaging questions so you can get some more information other than what I presented in the slides. So the RCC, the RCC was so much more than a grocery store to the community in Northeast Greensboro. It was a vehicle for the community to come together to meet their need for fresh, healthy, affordable food. It was a place where community members would have good jobs that they could work with dignity and earn a decent wage. It was also an example of the community's capacity to do for itself. And instead of having something give to them to work hard with experts in the field and create what they needed. Next. This is a picture of our staff shortly after the store closed. 
Um, those smiles you see on their faces are genuine, but the reality was a hard one for us, especially at the time. Despite years of planning and organizing and fundraising, we canvassed, we door knocked, we surveyed, we had community meetings where we asked people about their shopping habits and the foods they ate. We also asked those questions as we went door to door in the neighborhood. Um, it was a great time and we worked really hard organizing, connecting with people. We fundraised at the community meetings, which we had on a monthly basis. People passed the hat or whatever was available and people put money into that. Our goal was to have 1,000 members before the store opened, and we did. When the store opened, we had just over 1,000 members. We were very happy about that. And our local uh, elected officials supported us with money, and also they were very enthusiastic about the project. And our grand opening was well attended. People far and wide came to it, people across the city, but also people that had learned about the RCC project um, across the country and even outside of the country due to a crowdsourcing campaign we had knew about the RCC, so we had tremendous support and a great turnout for our grand opening. And one of the things that made us very, very happy and proud is that many of the staff employees at the store said that this was the best job they ever had. And that was important to the community when they were thinking about forming the RCC. They wanted this to be a good place where members of the community could get jobs. So we were very happy about that. Again, those smiles you see on their faces are genuine despite the store closing. This group really felt like family, and it was difficult for all of us when we had to close the store. But after two years, the RCC had to close, and the bottom line is it's because of insufficient sales. Next slide, please. We've kind of gotten this down to a science, if you will, and figured out that the reasons for our failure are what we call the two C's and the three M's. The first C is corporate competition, and the second one is capacity, and then under capacity are the three M's, which are management, marketing, and movement building. Next. So corporate competition challenges. Of course, we all know how ubiquitous the dollar stores are. They're everywhere. You can't go a block and not see one or more of them. That was one of the challenges for us as far as competition. Also, the market is dominated by Walmart and similar big box stores, and that was a tremendous challenge as well. We knew that was going to be a challenge, but we did not, um, we didn't realize how big a challenge, especially because while the RCC opened right down the street, almost within a stone's throw, a dollar store opened with the support of our city, and that made it very difficult for us, not to mention a few doors down in the shopping center from where the RCC was, there was also a dollar store. Um, because of those deeply entrenched shopping habits that were built on the proliferation of dollar stores and, and Walmart and the big box stores, it was incredibly hard for us to get past those competition challenges. Next slide, please. We had lots of challenges with capacity, too. Um, because the, the community was committed to hiring people that lived in the community that may have had challenges getting hired in the traditional market. So this means people that may have been unemployed or underemployed or even perhaps had been formerly incarcerated. It was really important to give those folks jobs, good jobs that paid them well, where they were welcome and respected. But the thing that we needed to do for this to be a success is we needed to get them in there, get them trained up really well so that they were able to do their jobs well and that they felt competent and, and um, confident. Uh, we also had trouble with finding general managers that had the right mix of hard skills and soft skills for the RCC. It was difficult finding someone that had the soft skills to manage a store in a black working class neighborhood like the RCC. Next, please. Some of our management woes were dealing with the general dearth of experienced GMs in the industry. So this wasn't just for the RCC or in North Carolina. Across the food co-op industry, there's a dearth of well-qualified general managers. We also, in the neighborhood where the RCC was in Northeast Greensboro, we needed a GM that could combine an understanding of the socio-cultural factors that were common in marginalized communities like the RCC and connect that understanding to staffing and training. So as it applies to how you deal with staff, how you train staff, also product selection, because again, the RCC is not a big box store. So we only had 10,000 square feet. We weren't like a Walmart or one of the big box grocery stores. So we had to figure out the right product mix to get there, to draw people in, and also how to merchandise them and make them look attractive to people because people are used to going to the big box stores where they can see 20 types of mayonnaise and 30 types of mustard. And we didn't have the shelf space to do that. So merchandising was important. Pricing was a huge challenge for us as well. 
um, we the tagline initially was healthy, affordable, and community owned. And we talked about repeatedly when we chose that tagline, when we talked about affordability, we talked about people being able to afford to shop at the RCC and that it was comparable to some of the larger stores that they were accustomed to shopping at, like Food Lion or Ingles or Kroger's. Unfortunately, the, the benchmark that people held us to was affordability as comparison to the dollar stores. And of course, and Walmart. And unfortunately, of course, we can't match that price point because we're a small independent grocer. Um, I cannot stress enough, the last M marketing is something that really blindsided us because we had gotten so much attention before. We took for granted that just like McDonald's does, the biggest fast food enterprise in the world, we needed to market before the store opened and after it opened as well. Next slide, please. Some of the things that we thought, some of the marketing fallacies that we had coming into this is, if we build it, they will come. We thought because the community said to us, we want this, we want this store, we need this, that if we opened a store, people would come and shop there, especially people in the community in droves. We also felt like because this was the only full service grocery store within a two and a half mile radius, that was our market area, that people would come to the store because they had no other choice. We failed to take into account that people have been shopping other places and managing to get fed for almost two decades. So they had already had these really deeply entrenched shopping habits. The reality was what we needed was a context that was specific, I'm sorry, a context specific marketing plan and the capacity for the staff and management to execute it. We had to recapture that market audience that we lost when the store closed two decades earlier. Next slide, please. What we needed to build was a movement. The RCC was not able to compete solely on price, location, and convenience. Those were the strengths of our competitors. We needed to give people an additional reason, something more than that to come and shop at the RCC. What we needed was a movement. And to be honest, we started out with that spirit, the movement spirit in mind. People were very much focused on self-determination and being able to do for themselves. They had had some other successes along those lines. And we began with that in mind, with that spirit of building a movement. But we lost that. Um, again, we started with that spirit and that's the way that we approached this. But unfortunately, when the store opened, especially when we began to see sales lag after the grand opening, we began to focus on simply the business aspects of the store. And of course it is a business, but with stores like the RCC, there are two things you have to keep in mind. A, it is a business, but also it's a movement. And again, that's something that our competition can't do. They can't build a movement. That was our strong suit. And we kind of lost sight of that. And as a result, the spirit of self-determination and the deep democracy that we had engendered by working together, thinking together, building this store together, we lost. So some of the lessons we learned, um, keys to sustainability. Um, organize, 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 and never stop, never stop. Again, you can build a genuine movement, and that's what this was in part for this community. That's something your competition cannot do. Please do not underestimate your competition. I know that sounds like an obvious thing. Uh, we didn't lose sight of that completely, but something that, that would have been helpful is to be mindful of your competition and what they're doing and build that awareness into the marketing and the movement building process of opening the store. Uh, we needed to find skilled and, and skilled management and people that were good for developing into skilled managers. We needed to find people that were gonna be interested in learning more about how to run a store in a community like this and support them to get the additional skills that they needed. And last but not least, build in the time and the opportunity for ongoing staff training. And again, with the priority being to hire people from that community that might not have um, found it easy to get jobs in the traditional market, it was very important to get people hired, get them trained up. So not that they were just competent, but that they were able to excel in their jobs, to feel confident in what they were doing, and to transfer those skills into being great employees at the RCC and if and when the time presented itself to take those skills out into the job market so that they were better off um, when the store after the store opened than they were before they came to work there. Thanks for joining us. And without further ado, I will turn things back over to Steve. All right. And I'm uh, back here. And um, I thought I'd let me say <clears throat> a couple of things. One, um, Please keep your questions coming. We will we will take a number of audience questions. Uh, first, though, I wanted to uh, give both uh, Ed and 
uh, Rudlin uh, opportunity to respond uh, to some of Shawnee's remarks. And uh, can you say a little bit about, you know, what was your specific role in the project and, you know, what are some, you know, high points that you want to like draw out about the experience of RCC? I had the good fortune of uh, having a chance to go into the community with Johnny very early in the process and start talking to people about cooperative economic development. Uh, it was something that was not in general on people's radar. What they were concerned about was development in the area. They wanted something to be built. They wanted someone to do it. And they weren't fully confident at that time that they could be the someone's doing it and benefiting from it. So Shani and I got a chance to be involved in a lot of the early meetings and, um, and talk to people about it, many of whom got really excited about it because it, fitted, it fit exactly into the general mindset of that community, which was fighting for and struggling for what they need. And when we remind people of all the other things that people in communities build for themselves, you know, churches, uh, uh, clubs, organizations, then the idea that this is something that you too can build. And certainly they didn't know where all the resources would come from. And I think it will help you with that. And um, so it, it, it was really an exciting project in that uh, regard. Um, we're so trained in this, this individual type of approach to, to business development. And we're trained to believe that developers who are in leagues with the banks and the city government and um, uh, are the ones who are going to do everything in the community. That, uh, that just was not something people felt strongly about at the time, but they became believers and built what they needed to do to get a store up and started. Great, thanks, Ed. Uh, Rudlin, uh, obviously you uh, at, at some point became uh, chair of the board, but talk about sort of what was your role within the co-op and any kind of you know points that you wanna highlight in terms of you know what, what you saw as some of the key lessons. So I joined the um, the RCC project as a member of the greater community who was interested in the work that was happening in Northeast Greensboro and the and I believed in the power for the for that community to be able to decide its own economic future and I I too had heard the lessons of um, of their previous organizing and um, was interested in being um, part of this next round of organizing which was to organize around building a grocery store to replace the Winn Dixie that um, that had left. And so I was asked to join the board in August of 2017, which was um, about almost a year after the store had been open. I had just been a community member attending meetings and, um, uh, and, and hanging around friends who were, who were working on the project. Upon joining the board, I got a much closer look at, um, at our successes as a business um, and movement, but also where we were struggling and needed support. Um, what isn't covered in the slides that I think um, is important is that the board itself struggled to, um, to meet and face the external challenges that the RCC was having. And we had done so much organizing around the store opening. As Shani said, we had been knocking on doors. We had, um, we had phone banks. We were uh, having community meetings. Um, just a lot of organizing had been happening prior to the opening of the store. And, and now we were faced with running it, right? And this was a whole beast in itself that I don't, uh, that I don't think we were prepared for. And, and through this, we realized as a board that we needed to focus on another key aspect of cooperative economics, which is our governance structures, right? Having a, a strong and, um, and working governance structure, in this case, a board. And so we focused on um, doing our own education to learn how to effectively function as a board. Um, in order to provide the strategy in the, in the direction that the store um, desperately needed. Um, and through the leadership of our first board chair, John Jones, and other founding um, board members, we were able to find support to learn how to govern ourselves and ultimately the store. The board was able to get a lot of support from, um, uh, from Fund for Democratic Communities, from F4DC, and, um, and we were able to leverage their connections to, to bring in the resources for our own development as a board. Um, as I reflect on the lessons learned in preparing for this, um, it, one thing that stuck out to me was the, the need to continue to organize and maintain our movement. And I wonder what it might have looked like if the board uh, had focused on our, our, one of our key skills, which was organizing, right? And, and, not, and not just had focused on learning the technical skills to run the board, but also 
um, but also while learning these skills, returning to what we could do best, which was to organize and talk to the folks in the neighborhood. So the strong push to develop our structures from, um, from, 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 from our technical assistance providers, as well as from myself, I was very key on like, we need to get our governance structures in place. Didn't give us enough room or time to hone in on the like, why aren't folks coming to the store, I think? Um, and what could we be doing differently to address that? I believe now, um, it, without a doubt, that governance is of, of a high importance when developing a cooperative business. We needed to learn how to run meetings. We needed to learn how to read and ask questions from the general manager report, um, develop board policies, et cetera. But we as a community and as leaders in the project should have made this as a priority from the beginning, right? This board development and this governance development, I think. And that governance cannot be something figured out when you have a storefront or when the uh, or when the resources are available, right? But that it, it but that we should have been building governance structures and um, um, and democratic leadership from the from the beginning more intentionally. I think we did do some of that, but just having it like intentional that we are going to train um, folks in um, in some of the key uh, board functions would have been really helpful in us trying to navigate how to be a board and also navigate how to run a store, right? And we let and we must let boards and steering committees govern themselves, right? Um, because they ultimately are responsible for the store and they ultimately are elected from the community. Um, and all of this within, you know, within clear structures and access to resources, which we were privy to with the strong leadership and support from Fund for Democratic Communities. Um, but to truly build and maintain a movement in communities such as the one in Northeast Greensboro, the board must not only represent the people, but we must be about the people. And I think we lost that a little bit um, as we as we struggle, especially as the numbers were looking uh, more and more terrible. We, as Shani said, we really focused on just the business and we lost sight of being about the people and figuring out from ourselves and from our community what it need, what we needed to do to um, to to figure out the RCC. And um, I'll just leave it with like, the, a, just a just economy requires all of us, right? And not, just the, um, and not just the elected folks that are serving on the board, but that we collectively must participate to create this just economy. Um, and, and, um, and we can help build more robust uh, governance structures to help support, support that. Thank you, Steve. Great. Um, so Rudlin, I'm gonna, ask you a question, I, I, not the most uplifting question, I suppose, but I, I think an important one. I mean, you were on the board that actually had to, you know, make the decision to close the store. And that obviously must have been intense, but can you talk about well, what what made you, bring or brought you guys to that decision and, and what were the steps you took in that process to, um, you know, close with dignity? Yes, intense is like half the word, Steve. It was a very intense um, <laughs> time for us. But I mean, collectively, we were we were looking at the numbers every um, every month as we were meeting monthly. We also had instituted um, a weekly meetings with the general manager that myself and um, our, our vice president were was attending. So another two members of the board was meeting with the general manager on a weekly basis, and then we as a board was meeting monthly. And um, and we were we were looking at the numbers going down and down and down and trying to figure out how to um, how to address this and what we can do to um, to bring our numbers up to help to support staff to support management to bring in the community and ultimately raise our sales and around November December um, in looking at the numbers we realized that we we could continue to um to to spend the money until it ran out and then be like oh we don't have any more money so we we have to close right um or and what we decided was that we were going to um we were going to make the decision to close the store so that we would be able to determine how the store would close and we wanted the store to close with dignity that was really important to us closing the store with both dignity and compassion and what that meant for us was that we wanted to be able to show care and respect to our key stakeholders um, and primarily our staff. We, uh, we really wanted to thank our staff for all the work they were doing 
um, especially because they were the ones in the store, right? They were the one, we were looking at the numbers once a month, but they were the ones in the store, still working, still fighting, still trying to make sales. Um, and we wanted to honor that in the, in the work that they've been doing um, since, uh, since the store opened. We also wanted to be able to um, responsibly handle all our legal and financial obligations. And we knew that if we waited until the money ran out, that we, uh, that we wouldn't be able to have um, uh, more of a say in how, in how the finances and the legal um, aspects would, would go down. So we wanted to uh, handle these things responsibly. And lastly, in terms of dignity and compassion, we wanted to leave in place the best possible footing for, um, for something good to happen in that space, right? We wanted to, um, we wanted another grocery store, anything else to come into that space so, the, so that the community could continue to benefit from the work that it had done, right? Um, and uh, and, and in order for us to do this, to, we, need, we knew we needed to make the decision to close the store while we still had a little bit of money in, the, um, in, our, in our account so that we could have control over that and control it in a way that um, was responsible to our stakeholders as well as to, um, to ourselves and the hard work that had been done. So in December, we had uh, several meetings and we officially made that decision to, to close the store. And we decided that, um, that we were not going to announce it until after, after the break, uh, after the holiday break. So came January, we scheduled three meetings prior to announcing it publicly. Um, we met with uh, community leaders, we met with the staff, um, and we met with a, a, we met with our, um, our, the, our lenders, right? And we broke those, the news down to them first so that they knew um, before we made it public that we were closing on the store. And, um, and I've had bad days in my life, <laughs> but that, that was a bad day. Um, it, it, was a, it was a really bad day. It was a tough, a tough day and I'm still like tearing up thinking about it. But being able to do that and being able to have the power to um, to make that decision, to announce, and to talk to our close friends and our allies first before everyone could um, could be privy to um, to like bad news was so important to us, so that folks would be able to have conversations with each other and be able to um, process collectively as a community and to to hone in on the relationships that we had built and was so important in keeping the RCC open and running. Um, and so, uh, and so we had those conversations, and then that evening we uh, released a press release um, announcing the closing of the store, and um, and we as a board just forged on with uh, with with all the things that needed to happen to close the store. Right? We had just uh, two years ago we had worked, or the previous board had worked to open the store, and um, and I'm humbled to have been given the the responsibility to work with my fellow board members to to make that important decision to to close the store with dignity and compassion. Thanks, uh, Ruben. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, one of the positive uh, the outcomes that come out of the, the Greensboro experience is it's, it's really impacted the, the food co-op movement. I want to ask Ed about this. So, you know, when, when RCC was first proposed, as I recall, you guys weren't necessarily, you know, welcomed with open arms, uh, but but a lot of things have changed among food co-ops. So can you talk about that? The, the, the prevailing uh, ideas and much of the consulting world around the existing food co-op movement was that there was a certain set of demographics that were factors for success. And they were listed as being um, percent of educated people, percent of people with middle class and above wealth, and, um, and the percent of white people. And they were listed as three separate factors and communities that didn't have them were said to have weak demographics. And a lot of the people doing consulting at that time were somewhat dismissive of those communities with weak demographics. These weren't the projects they wanted to work on, their assumption was it wasn't gonna work. Um, and so consequently, the set of skills and information that would have been most appropriate to helping make them successful I'm perfectly convinced that it is possible to make this work. Uh, it's just a lot harder than many people think that it is. Uh, and what happened was we did not early on get the support we needed. And for better than a year, uh, we continued to complain to the folk who were saying those things 
that um, that some of these attitudes were really rooted in some kind of racist and elitist thinking. And I'm proud to say that they changed. Um, uh, fortunately, the folk we were listening to actually, you know, they had a conscience and a heart and they listened and it's like, uh, or oh, realizing what they were saying, what they were doing, many of them changed and have come to thank us for it later and have apologized in many ways uh, and tried to send us some, uh, some assistance. Some of the things that happened may have been too late. Uh, I, don't, I, I will not put the blame on them either as, as one thing, uh, but I know that they did try to send some assistance uh, at a point when, um, you know, all the way from uh, an interim manager at one point that we had to uh, some additional looks at business performers and other kinds of things. Uh, but among the other things, they didn't really know who the other vendors were, the, the natural and the whole BC uh, natural organic food uh, cooperatives have a certain set of uh, vendors that they deal with. They have a certain kind of scale that is required to make that a reasonable uh, kind of operation. And so they didn't know that there were wholesale uh, food vendors that were available that could enable a price point sort of along the level of what a food line is able to sell at. And that there are independent groceries that still are open that have not been destroyed yet, who are regularly buying from such uh, dealers. And this is information that people didn't have. And early on, rather than saying, we don't know how to do this, let us you know, try to figure it out with you. The idea was it just won't work. And uh, again, I think there's a lot of change that's taken place in uh, the food co-op movement, uh, where there are projects that a lot of people are really, really working hard to help succeed. Um, in order to rectify some of the errors that took place at that earlier stage in their development. And Shani probably knows a lot more about that as she sits on the board of the Food Co-op Initiative. Yeah, Shani, maybe could you just pick up on Ed's comments and talk about sort of, you know, how the Food Co-op Initiative and the Food Co-op world in general is, is addressing these issues? Well, Steve, um, there's a lot of thinking going on and some planning now going along, along around about training up for management, because again, that's a dearth that is, is existent in the industry across the board. So um, Columinate, formerly CDS and FCI, the Food Co-op Initiative are both working on um, initiatives and, and working with management. FCI is also, the Food Co-op Initiative is also working with communities because there are a lot of co-ops similar to the RCC and in communities that are similar to the RCC that are coming on the radar. As a matter of fact, that is the growing edge right now in um, grocery cooperatives. So a lot of training is going to people that are forming those co-ops. Again, they're looking at ways to train up management um, to work in those co-ops and communities similar to the RCC. So people are really realizing that need and, and plan making plans, working with community, working with one another to try to figure out ways to get management trained again in the hard skills that are necessary which is sometimes easier to do than the soft skills and it, it bears mentioning here that it's particularly challenging because for the big box stores like walmart's and ingles and kroger's there's a home office so there's somebody that's back there that's analyzing your sales is crunching those numbers is even sending recommendations to management about what to do in the independent co-op grocery world, there's no one to do that. That manager has to be able to have all those hard skills in addition to learning how to function in the communities that they're, they're dealing with. So you've got soft skills and hard skills that are equally as important for the store success. And you need a manager that can learn, learn pretty quickly and make adjustments really well and figure that whole mix out. And I want to add to that. And also he has to be able to be a trainer. Mm -hmm. the, that same manager has to be a good teacher, has to be a retail generalist, has to be a community liaison uh, and a team builder in community that he might not be familiar with. So it's an incredibly big challenge. We have to figure out a way to meet it. And that will probably mean over time, training more and more people out of the very communities that we're working with, as opposed to depending on other people who have been trained elsewhere to come in and do a good job at all of those things at one time. I would also add, Steve, that there has been an increase in, um, in, in universities that are offering masters in cooperative management to help address these needs as well and working specifically with and um, in, in trying to bring in um, people of color to attend these, these programs, um, not just in the food industry, but in other industries where management is also 
uh, a huge issue. Uh, at Dowie, uh, we partner with Rutgers ourselves to um, to help address some of the management, the lack of management skills that we're seeing in the field. Um, to uh, and and we're focusing on bringing in uh, managers of color and people that are often left out in positions of power, um, such as management. Um, so to to help expand the pool, right? So that there's more of us to choose from. There's more. There's more of us that know how to do the to do the work in our communities, right? And not just bringing in outside folks to do the work for us. Great, um, so we have a ton of questions from the audience, so I'm gonna to try to get to some of them. Um, one was about the membership and, and how important was the membership, both in terms of, I guess, the heart of the co-op, but also, you know, in terms of raising equity and, and you know, sort of making the co-op happen. So Steve, our goal before opening the store was to have 1,000 members and each of those members would pay a one-time fee of $100. So that's $100,000 that was going to come from the community into this project. And so when the store opened, when we had our grand opening, we did have a little over 1,000 members. So we, we met that goal. That was important for two reasons. One is kind of to show the outside world, the co-op world, that even in communities that are under-resourced and marginalized, there are resources that these communities can pool their resources and make something happen that they need to happen in their community. Um, also, it was important for that community because there were still some people in that community that bought into what society tells them about communities like theirs that are mutual, marginalized. So it was important for people to see that, hey, you know, we had the heart, we had the soul, we had the talent, the thinking to make this happen, and we were able to pool our financial resources and make it happen. So that was very important. And also, when lenders are able to see communities that are able to come together and pool their financial resources that way, you're able to leverage that and get money from lenders to, for projects like the RCC and other co-ops and other projects that the community wants as well. Great, thanks. Um, another question, I thought this was an interesting one. So uh, you've apparently persuaded at least some of the listeners that, the, that these two C's and three M's are all important. If you had to pick one, which one would you pick and which would you say is sort of the, the most essential? Where where do you put your the greatest amount of energy? You could cheat and say uh, capacity because you can use it to fold it around everything else that's on the list uh -huh. um, and use it to beat down corporate competition. But, uh, you know, we wanted to break it out that way to help people look at it as opposed to, I mean, it's not really a buffet to, pick the meal you want. It's, it's, you need to look at it and pay attention to all of that. Um, and no, there, there isn't a one that's so much more important. A failure at any one of those points can lead to failure, which was why it's so complex trying to turn the store around, because there was never just one thing we needed to fix. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going on at one time uh, in a blizzard. And ultimately, given enough time and given enough money, but we're not talking about a hundred years and a billion dollars, because that's not that's not reasonable. Um, but you know, at the point the store uh, closed, things were still going downhill. So in answer to the question, like, you know, how much longer do you need to turn this around? It's like if it keeps going in that direction till the end of time, you know. So it would have had to change directions, but again, the direction was complex. And on looking back at it, reflecting on it, we can see that the complexity comes out of all of, of the interconnection between all of those factors. Yeah, it, I, it's a longer conversation, but I, I think it would be interesting to think about key performance indicators and in, in light of that framework and whether they actually line up. But um, uh, another sort of related question had to do with, you know, you talked about the need to one of the M's was about building a movement, right? And, um, you know, what do you, what does that act, if, if you were to, you know, you, it was sort of acknowledged, uh, Shawnee, that, you know, that the, um, you guys sort of faltered on that after the store had opened, what would you do differently? You know, how, how you know, given, given limited resources, what are specific things that could have been done uh, to keep that going a little bit stronger? You know, Steve, one of the things that um, we had done, again, before the store opened was we had community meetings every month. 
and they were well attended. And before the store opened, we had two annual meetings. The first one, when I say there was standing room only, there were well over 200 people there. The second one, not quite as well attended, but still plenty of attendance. Um, and we, and because we had those meetings, that was something that the community was accustomed to. We were accustomed to. When the store opened, the decision was made to to have fewer meetings, to have them maybe quarterly. I think that was a challenge for the community. I think we went from having this sense of community and connection and working together and thinking together to build this entity. And then all of a sudden that kind of stopped. And I think at that point, the community was kind of lost um, as to how to connect to this project in a way that didn't feel just like, you know, a consumer going somewhere to spend money. And I think the, the, the leadership, um, the management of the store, maybe even the staff, we were at a loss with how to connect with community. So as a result, we just kind of fell back on what we all know to do, which is to address it um, as a business. So I, I, one of the things I would suggest is that uh, you either continue the community meetings or have them with some regularity, or there is some process that you, if we had the monthly, maybe we go to having them every other month. And then as interest maybe waned or is, is, is the movement, once the store opened, got stronger, you know, got some legs under it, then you then you bust it down to quarterly. But I think still having a way for the community to connect to that store other than consumers was very important. And so and that's board, what I would have done differently. And towards the end, the board also recognized, we, uh, the board also was like, we need to do something about this. And so um, a little too late, but we, we started a, a uh, a committee focusing on that, harnessing those skills that we had on already on the team to try to um, to try to build that connection again between um, between the store and uh, in the community. And so having that as a as again as Shani said in her slides, having that as at the forefront, like how are you going to continue continuously um, keep the community engaged? Um, is, is, is essential to, to getting people in your store, right? Because ultimately it was due to a lack of sales. We didn't have enough people in the store buying uh, the products. Um, and so, it, you know, reflection on, on, on the work we did as a board being that this could have been a, of a higher priority. And as Shani said, we, 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 we focused on just the business aspects. Like how are we gonna um, learn how to read p l statements so that we can address it with the with the general manager and not how are we bringing people um how are we talking to our neighbors neighbors and interacting with our community great um steve there are a couple of other factors i, I just wanted to mention um there were also some issues in terms of how the build out of the the store took place with the parking signage uh, and some other things that that made for some challenges. These are things that could have been addressed uh, and needed to have been addressed by management at, at a point, but they were also connected with our work with the, with the developer. Uh, some of it was prior to the management being on hand. So all of this stuff has to be very, very carefully integrated because it's, again, it's hard. This is something that is right on the edge of being impossible, but it's not impossible. <laughs> and so you don't want anything to be going wrong. And so, you know, a storefront that you couldn't park directly in front of and a sign too small to see from the road, you know, are things that left some people not sure if the store was open. But then mm -hmm. the, the cultural thing of some people thinking that a co-op always meant you had to be a member to shop there and not sure if it was open to the public. So later on, we had to put up signs saying it is open to the public. But all of these things were little steps, you know, in the way that was part of the larger thing of the general problem of maintaining the the, the movement momentum around it and challenges with a management never quite capturing all of the different things they needed to be able to do and do well uh, with, with the store um, including the training and the uh, development the ongoing and continuous development of the employees in the store great thanks um so this is kind of an interesting question uh it was really kind of you know what is the um what is the legacy of rcc in terms of the the members in terms of you know do they have they changed their shopping habits have they joined buying clubs uh movement organizations do they think about co-ops differently any any changes of that sort that you've noticed 
there's not a buying club that has developed there yet. It was very, it was heartening to hear the discussions that took place at the meetings where the closing of the store was announced, because it was very, very clear that there was a shift in attitude and a shift in understanding among a lot of people in the community. Um, and it was, the, the conversation pretty quickly moved from some people saying, you all did this, you all did that, to some other people saying, no, 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 this was a court. We should be saying we. And so I believe that the full effect of it in terms of later developments has not yet been felt. Um, we're just right at just under one year since the store has closed. So, you know, I'm going to give it time for people to continue to think about other things that they would like to see and build. And I know that this is going to happen in a new context where you don't have to tell nearly as many people what a co-op is for the first time or the possibility that you can find some resources to help you do something that you really want to do. And so we're looking forward to those things continuing to develop. Right. Um, yeah, that that's, that sort of raises a related question. There was a question about whether or, or to what extent there was a co-op ecosystem in, in Greensboro, like were there other credit unions, other types of co-ops that were able to support you or, or was that one of the challenges that you faced, that there, there wasn't that ecosystem? You know, Steve, there certainly were, um, there are other co-ops in Greensboro. You know, there are credit unions, um, more than one. We have, you know, retail operations like um, REI. There's even another food co-op here in town, um, but that food co-op is the traditional type. So they have the natural and organic foods, they have the, the price points that people in this particular community were not comfortable with. So it, it is an e interesting ecosystem in that it wasn't a thriving one. There weren't a lot of other examples of co-ops that people could point to that they were aware of and that they felt comfortable with. And that was one of the challenges for us. Quite frankly, I thought that when people heard the word co-op, there would be middle-aged and younger people that would gravitate to the RCC project because you know they're familiar with co-ops, like I said, because of the natural food co-ops that proliferate. But instead, it was the middle-aged and older people that gravitated to the project. And I think it was because of the spirit of cooperativeness that people understood they were, they were old enough to remember a time for African-Americans when the only time we could have thriving businesses was when we pooled our resources and we worked cooperatively. So those were the folks that really gravitated toward the project uh, around the thinking of, of co-op and, and it being a co-op. Um, so yeah, that's what I want to say about it. It's my observation. And I think one of the legacies of that, Steve, um, is that the our ecosystem and the folks that were mostly attending the community meetings were um, were my elders and um, and older folks who um, it, who as Shani talked about the who embodied the spirit of cooperatism. And they were, uh, and they remained the leaders, uh, especially in our in our final community meeting when we talked about the closing, and um, and and just the importance of them having done this work so that the younger generation would see that uh, the that cooperating and coming together can lead to success, can lead to um, can lead to things changing and 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 folks doing for themselves in a way that you often don't see in, um, in communities of color and in, um, in black communities, poor black communities. And so I think that's really important too, and that we, um, it, and that we help build in a sense, a, a little ecosystem for ourselves. Um, and also that we, the, the ecosystem was more regional, I would say too, with, um, with us making visits to Durham and to Alamance County to see other cooperatives in the region that were, um, that were led by communities of color or had uh, more similarities to the type of work that we were um, that we were trying to do at the RCC. Great. Um, so this is slightly related question, somewhat different, uh, but it, it obviously there were a lot of partnerships that made the RCC happen. Uh, so the question was: Is what partnerships did you have, and what are partnerships maybe that you didn't have but wish you had? Um. That's interesting. Uh, F4DC is a small foundation. There are many foundations here in this area. Most of them had nothing to do with this effort. And it's not because they didn't know about it. We told them they, they didn't get interested. Uh, I think that the mindset of many of the foundations is alone, kind of charity, uh, charitable kinds of things. And this effort at community self-reliance was something that didn't spark their, their attention. 
I think that's a problem that needs to be fixed. And, uh, and so some of the work that F4DC has done in philanthropy has been around raising the stuff about the significance of community ownership, the idea of building community wealth, the idea of needing to democratize and share and, um, and shift uh, finances in a different kind of way, investment and finance. Um, there's also, you know, there was a real reluctance on the part uh, the city government engaged in it, but somewhat sluggishly and at a level a little smaller than what we had hoped for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, someone might get mad at me for saying, but it's true. Um, and they know we were asking for more than that. In fact, at one point they had suggested they had, had more than that to offer and then the offer was, was reduced, but we still appreciate the offer they did come up with. On the other hand, the county government, uh, they decided that they were gonna play tough and they didn't want to have anything at all to do with it. Uh, and there was, I think there might've been some tiny amount that finally came from the county government that uh, one of our county, that a couple of our county commissioners were able to do. There are a couple of county commissioners who tried very hard, but it's a very, very conservative uh, uh, county commission that it's hard to get anything out of. And they should have been supportive of it as well. Um, uh, as far as I know, there was no support that came from the state government. I'm not sure that, I mean, you know, uh, economic development grants and such things, you know, that typically exist, and these are serious economic developments, should have been, should have found this an attractive uh, way to engage the community, and that, that, that didn't really happen. Uh, but we did have some churches that came through and did very well uh, partnering with us. We had national financial organizations, again, like uh, uh, the, uh, some, uh, the uh, what is now Seed Commons um, and Shared Capital, uh, that you know did the outstanding part of the bulk of the, the lending into the project. Um, and so that was very, very important. Uh, in terms of technical assistance, we were able to get some from private consultants in Chicago, uh, as well as uh, Philadelphia area. Um, and again, people helped us negotiate contracts and did any number of other things. So we had some, some support in, in that regard. Uh, we didn't have any support from the community colleges. They didn't volunteer to help train all our people. Uh, it would have been nice if they had, but they didn't. And, um, uh, you know, what you want to do is be part of a community that recognizes that this is a kind of whole community effort and everybody kind of pitches in. Uh, because this is an, a new effort in Greensboro, it was one, in spite of the fact that there's a few credit unions and a different kind of food co-op, this wasn't something that people had on their radar as being something that they wanted to support. Hopefully in the future, that will not be the case and people will have a chance to build very, very successful enterprises inside their communities. Great, thanks. Um, I'll ask one more public question that I got, which was really, you know, are, is there specific advice you have for uh, folks who are uh, organizing co-ops in, in black working class communities like Northeast Springsboro? Johnny always says, organize, organize, organize. <laughs> And never stop. The same never thing stop. marketing. Never start from the very beginning marketing and organizing. Do it throughout the project and never stop. And I would also want to remind people to remember, remind people to remember, that um, communities do have something. If, if somebody is trying to do this as a charitable activity rooted in the idea that, you know, those people don't have anything, so they you know, you shouldn't ask them to put anything in it. You shouldn't ask them to volunteer their time or effort. That's wrong. Uh, people build institutions that they want in their communities, but they just lost the track of building some of the financial institutions um, and they can regain that. And so we had one class of membership. Everybody was a $100 member. I don't care how much extra money you had, you couldn't have a one membership. Now you could have, you could make a personal loan to the business or something, but there was one class of membership even people who didn't have much money who could pay $5 down and $5 a month could be members. And as soon as they got on a payment plan, they were counted as full members. Mm -hmm. And they were often really proud of themselves when they paid it off. So the idea of communities being able to do things for themselves and wanting to do things for themselves is very real and alive. And I would caution people who are doing this work to never forget that. Great. Um, oops. I'm going to ask one last question because we're running short on time, which is, you know, you're talking uh, publicly about, you know, failure. That's not a super common thing to do. You know, uh, just how does that feel to, to be doing that? 
I know you guys not just done this webinar. You've you know there's a paper on our website. You've you've been at conferences. It feels liberating and freeing. <laughs> feel very scary right like i feel there's almost 300 people on this webinar and folks are reading the article and it still feels for me it's still very personal um having me having made that that decision um so it feels i feel very exposed in talking about this and that folks are seeing just glimpse of what happened um throughout the the five plus years um, five plus two years, seven years, eight years that this project has been on. So, um, so while it feels it feels good to be able to um, flesh out some of my the thoughts in my head, I still feel a little guarded, and I still feel very protective about the RCC and about the community that the RCC um, belongs to, and um, and not making this about you know what can we learn about the, this other food co-op, right? But it's really we're talking about people's lives, people lost jobs. Um, and people invested hours of their lives into this project and we lost people along the way. And so it, for me, it feels very exposed um, and very raw still. Uh, and we're coming up on that one year anniversary. I can't believe it, but it's still, it's still, very, um, it's still very scary. But hopefully our willingness to talk about things that didn't work are gonna help some other people make it work in some communities. And that's the thing that's you know, most liberating about it is that if you can learn and not do the things that we didn't do as well as we needed to, then the chance of your success is so much greater. And we're rooting for you. We know yes. it can happen. We were open for two years. You can do it and we're rooting for you and we're here for you. Well, uh, great. Uh, thanks. Um, so we, we, we've come to the hour. So I want to acknowledge that. I know there's like another hour's worth of questions there. Uh, I'll try to collect those and maybe maybe you'll get responses at some point to some of them. Uh, thanks so much everyone for participating in this call. Thanks uh, Shawnee, uh, Rudlin and, and Ed. Um, and uh, last, I'll, I'll, you know, you heard from Amanda earlier, uh, we really are trying to meet that match by the end of the year. So please I know you got a lot of requests right now, but if you can go to the link and help take advantage of the matching campaign, uh, we would be very grateful. Um, so uh, thanks again to uh, Rudlin, uh, uh, Shawnee and Ed for making themselves available and for Fund for Democratic Communities for, for co-sponsoring this webinar. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone.